All right. I have Did to hit continue that? first. Hold on. I'll advance the slides. Um, I'll try to just kind of read you on that, but feel free to you know say and next slide and I'll just do it. Okay. okay. All right. Hello everyone. My name is Kat Henke and I'm the GIS coordinator for the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership. And today I'm here with Sarah Gottlieb, the director of freshwater science and strategy for the Nature Conservancy, as well as Katie Owens, the Upper Coosa program director for the Nature Conservancy as well. And today we're going to be talking with you about assessing and addressing barriers to fish passage at road stream crossings in Georgia. And so for the past several years, together as a group, we've been working in the Georgia Aquatic Connectivity Team, which is a team of partners from different organizations and different sectors, all coming together to build a community of practice of dam removal and aquatic organism passage across the state. And together we've been working on addressing these barriers through a variety of different methods, which we will talk about going forward. Next slide. And so for those of you who are unaware, culverts at road stream crossings and other types of structures at road stream crossings can cause a very many different issues for aquatic organisms and for people as well. Poorly designed culverts and undersized culverts can cause many issues for migration of aquatic organisms and they also can be susceptible to failure during flood events. And you can see from these photos that this is a, these are very common structures that you might not have noticed um, while in streams or um, driving that, that they can actually be quite a problem and can act as dams for, for aquatic organisms. And there are quite a few within the state. Let me go next. However, there's been a lot of efforts to address these problems across the region and across the United States. You can see here that these are open bottomless arch culverts that provide for full passage of organisms underneath of, of these structures, as opposed to the previous structures that um, act as dams and, and are undersized and have many issues. And so you can see that there's also passage for, for dry passage for terrestrial organisms, and they can span the full bankful width of the stream. And so these, these are also less susceptible to flooding and blowing out as well. And so these designs are what is ideal and what we're working to achieve at some of these, these problem structures in the state. Next slide. And so in order to identify where these problem structures are, SARP has been working together with the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative by adopting a standardized protocol to take measurements at these structures and identify whether or not they're barriers. Not every road stream crossing is going to be a problem. Many of them are embedded and passable by organisms. So we need to go to each of these crossings and figure out whether or not they're problems. And that is what this stream crossing survey data form and instruction guide that we have helps us to go out into the field and assess each of them for aquatic organism passage. And so for the past two years, we have worked to adopt this protocol and train partners to take this information at structures across the southeastern region and in Georgia. And so this, this is a training that we that we provide and it's a three day training and most of that is in the field. And so partners are able to learn how to use the protocol. It takes about 15 minutes per pipe structure to get all of the information needed. And then we can score that to determine whether or not the crossing is a barrier for aquatic organisms. And we held um, a training in Georgia about two years ago. This is a, a picture of that training. This is the, the stream team and, and others for, for Georgia. And you can see this is another problem structure. It's a box culvert with a big drop on it. And one of the ways that we collect this information as we're in the field and training people and when they then go out and train other people and collect this information is by using survey one, two, three for ArcGIS. And this is an application that is connected to SARP's Southeast Aquatic Barrier Inventory and Prioritization Tool. And so when our partners are in the field and assessing crossings using a smartphone or other device, they can enter the information and it automatically uploads into our inventory. And so we can really get an idea of the degree of aquatic habitat fragmentation by, this, by using this setup and this information. 
And so just to give you a little a taste of what it's been looking like in Georgia since we've been, been conducting these assessments, there are over 85,000 crossings in Georgia. And so that is any place where a road crosses the stream. And as I mentioned earlier, not all of these will be barriers to aquatic organisms. So we have been able to assess over a thousand crossings across the state. And some of those assessments have been done prior to the implementation of the SARP cross crossing survey protocol. So some of those were done by University of Georgia and the Forest Service, but we've also assessed about three or 400 more crossings using our protocol. And so there's a thousand or so assessed and then 405 of these are barriers. So they've determined to be based on the scoring and the survey to be barriers to aquatic organisms. And so then we look at those barriers to determine which ones are the most ecologically beneficial for removal. And another really amazing partnership that is developed through the aquatic connectivity team is working with um, the Department of Natural Resources bat biologists who are also taking information out in the field to determine where bats are roosting We've been working with them to collect additional information while they're out that helps us to determine which are barriers. So all the color dots that you're looking at are the 110 additional barriers that have been visited with the partnership of these bat biologists. And you can see just, just how um, bad some of these barriers are. 37 of the 110 are barriers. And this just presents a really wonderful opportunity to partner with DNR and to partner with the Department of Transportation and Highways administration to, to look at some of these culverts and really understand how many barriers there are across the landscape and then work on actually addressing and implementing some of these. So when looking and drilling down into a basin, you can tell just how widespread this issue is. The maps that I previously showed you just show some of the basins where we've got information. One of those basins is the Etowah, Etowah watershed. And truly the, the amount of road stream crossings in the Etowah watershed is just astounding. You're looking at um, hundreds, possibly thousands of road stream crossings just right in this basin alone. And so there's lots of work to be done um, to assess these crossings and then to determine which ones should we should invest our, our time and, and capacity and funding into to remove but um, we are working to address this issue within the aquatic connectivity team. So uh, a couple of years ago, the Nature Conservancy received uh, funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to um, conduct a complete assessment of all of the road stream crossings in a watershed that's been identified um, by a number of partners as a very high priority for aquatic um, restoration. Uh, this is the Holly Creek um, watershed, which is a subset of the overall um, Upper Conestoga watershed in far northwest Georgia that you can see here on the map in the, in the top left corner of um, the slide. Uh, what this is showing is the initial assessment that uh, the Nature Conservancy did using GIS um, to see where each um, road that you can see here in black crosses a stream. That's where all of those red dots are. Um, and we parsed this out into a series of maps um, that contained over 200 road crossings <clears throat> that we then um, hired uh, several teams to work with us to conduct this thorough assessment over the course of several months. Um, so we worked with a um, group of students actually. Um, one group was high school students through the Leaders uh, for Environmental Action in the Future. And then a team of students from Dalton State College um, went out and conducted assessments at each of these sites. Um, this is what that looks like um, out in the field. These are the two teams um, taking that data using the protocol that Kat described. So you can see here they're taking various measurements of the height and width and water depth. And you know when there's an outfall here that has um, a drop, all those measurements um, are taken and then uploaded to the database that Kat described um, and given a priority score. Um, so this is the result of that assessment. All of the colors on the map here that you can see relate um, to the legend there in the lower right. And you can see out of um, around 200 uh, sites that were visited, not all were accessible. So we, the data that we collected was slightly less than the number of road crossings that were identified. But you can see that we have um, 
25 between the ones that are severe or significant barriers. Um, and then we added some additional information to decide which of these crossings we really wanted to focus on addressing. So this information tells us how much of a barrier to aquatic organism passage each of these crossings is. And then we looked at how much upstream habitat could be opened <clears throat> if the crossing were to be replaced. <clears throat> and we also looked at whether there was known presence of aquatic species, especially rare aquatic species in the vicinity of any of those sites. And we landed on several um, that Katie is now gonna talk to you about. All right, so there are three sites in Holly Creek that we collaborated with Murray County on to choose. And the three sites you see on the map here Two are located in what we call the Rock Creek watershed that flows into Holly Creek, and then one is located in the Yellow Creek watershed. So these three sites were all ranked in our higher, moderate, severe uh, categories. So each of those sites is going to really open up significant habitat for some listed species or a variety of, of more common species. And where we are with all three of these projects is we've currently ordered two of the three bottomless culvert for our Rock Creek sites and the Yellow Creek sites, we've already identified the culvert that is to be used at that site, but haven't used it. So Pomona Pipe is the group that we're working with to purchase these structures for these three specific sites. And in 2021, we expect to put at least our two Rock Creek structures actually on the ground. So those were actually delivered um, to Murray County here in, in February. So we have both of the Rock Creek structures in-house and we'll be constructing, constructing those structures within the next six months. Two other exciting projects that the Nature Conservancy has been involved in recently in terms of aquatic connectivity um, are Raccoon Creek and Mill Creek. And, and this slide shows the Raccoon Creek crossing. Raccoon Creek is located in the Etowa watershed, which is the watershed that Kat talked about that has numerous crossings all over it. Raccoon Creek is really interesting because it's the only biologically significant tributary that's downstream of Lake Altoona. So the Etowa is kind of broken into an upper Etowa and a lower Etowa with Lake Altoona being the major impoundment in the center of the watershed. Um, Raccoon Creek is home to over 40 different species of fish. There are two federally listed fish that are found within this particular reach of this project. We have the federally endangered Etowa darter and the federally threatened Cherokee darter. So this particular culvert project was ranked as the number one culvert project in all of Northwest Georgia. And it's because of that biologically um, diverse fish population that we have specifically in this watershed. This project was a major partnership with Paulding County, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Georgia DNR, and Kennesaw State University. And if you look at this before photo, you can see it was a box culvert. During high flow events, the water actually ran underneath the concrete itself. Um, so although water does go through those four box culverts, uh, in terms of stability, the structure itself was undermined with water flowing actually underneath the structure. So again, a, a major partnership with numerous partners. Uh, what I would like to mention about this is when we were taking out this culvert and putting in the new culvert, our partnership with Kennesaw State University was tracking different fish populations upstream and downstream and really trying to get a good handle on what is aquatic connectivity doing for the watershed? So this was an exciting project for us because of the number of species that are at this site and that partnership with Kennesaw State that allowed us to look at different large species, but also small species that were able to move between these structures. And I can tell you before the structure was removed, we only saw a handful of fish within a six month period be able to get through those box culverts. And as soon as it was removed, we started seeing um, species of all different sizes moving upstream and downstream. So really an exciting project in terms of project uh, aquatic connectivity. And this is the final project I mentioned. So Mill Creek uh, is located in the Conasauga watershed. So still part of our upper Coosa watershed. Similar to the Etowah, the Conasauga has some great biodiversity. 
this project was actually a project where we had two failing metal culverts. Uh, the tops had actually eroded away. So there's a road that runs on the top of those culverts and it had caved into the actual culverts themselves. And the access on the other side of the road was completely blocked from the caving in of, of the top of the road. So this was a partnership with the Forest Service. This is on, on National Forest up in the Conasauga. And we were able to take out those two metal culverts and replace it with a open um, aluminum box culvert. And that opened up access to not only fish, but it also opened up access into a thousand plus acre burn unit for the Forest Service. So this, this project was also a partnership with the local county, Murray County, but it was a, a great, great opportunity for TNC to open up public access into a national forest, but also improve the actual stream for biodiversity. Thanks, Katie. So just to wrap up um, our discussion, I did want to mention um, another project that the Aquatic Connectivity team is working on right now. Um, what you're looking at is the Georgia Stream Crossing Handbook, um, which is intended as a guide for anyone um, that has to deal with these road crossing structures. This was a document that was developed as a partnership between U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Georgia Department of Resources, Department of Natural Resources in 2012. So it's getting a little bit dated. The regulations have changed. And as we've been discussing, we have a lot more information now um, about the scope and the scale of the problem. And we also have a lot of case studies under our belt. So uh, we're currently in the process of updating this handbook and hope to have a revised version of it available for the community to use um, late this summer, 2021. So keep your eyes out for that. We will be posting it on the Aquatic Connectivity Team website. Uh, and with that, I just wanted to put up our contact information. Uh, if any of you would like to reach out to us to discuss any of these projects or to get involved in the Aquatic Connectivity Team, here are our email addresses. Feel free to reach out to any of us. Check out our websites. Um, there's a lot of great information on all of them, and in particular, the Georgia Aquatic Connectivity Team website, um, where you can find a lot more detail on many of the projects um, and initiatives that we've discussed today. Thank you.